coming to the Preventing Clean Room Catastrophes online training course. I'd like to introduce you to Morgan Pullen, the instructor for today. He is the principal consultant for MicroWrite, a particle monitoring and contamination control consulting firm. Morgan brings 30 years experience working in clean rooms and is a subject matter expert in particle monitoring. He has been involved with various clean room projects working in over 40 countries. With hands-on experience in projects ranging from clean room design, construction, validation, monitoring program development, particle control design, and a product management for clean room related products and systems. Addressing monitoring and control solutions in a wide variety of clean industries, such as pharmaceutical, medical device, semiconductors, data storage, aerospace, defense, automotive, optical, and food and beverage manufacturing. And I'd like to now welcome Morgan Pullen. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Preventing Clean Room Catastrophes. And as indicated, my name is Morgan Pullen. I'm going to talk today about uh, a variety of catastrophes that I've experienced and helped customers get over throughout my years in clean rooms. And some of these are horror stories, and um, these are from my career of working in clean rooms for over 30 years. This presentation is based upon my experience and research to provide the uh, best information possible related to contamination control. There are other methods that exist, but this is no means a, a method to promote products or services. So clean rooms are used in multiple industries all over the world. And having had the opportunity to be involved in clean room projects in a variety of industries in over 40 countries, I have witnessed a wide variety of clean room related contamination control problems. And some of these incidents are entertaining and can work as examples of what not to do um, and help provide insight on the important aspects around a contamination control program that some companies or organizations have unfortunately missed, skipped, omitted, or not even known about. So today we're gonna to be talking about a variety of different things. So I'm gonna start out with an entertaining story of how I was paid to smoke cigarettes in a clean room. Then we'll talk about poorly designed clean rooms and some tests that have been done that actually support these poorly designed clean rooms that allow people to go into operating um, states where later they found out they've had either product um, or, or production problems. So what about myself? I've been involved in clean rooms for over 30 years. I started in 1984 and I've done a wide variety of projects all over the world. So I'm going to be sharing some of the stories I'm going to share are not just based here in the United States, but from different parts of Europe and Asia as well. So when we talk about clean room catastrophes, the thing I like to start about is Companies and individuals who work for companies get into trouble quite often because they don't know um, enough about clean room operations. And too often the clean room itself is uh, including the aspects of the housekeeping, recertification and testing become somewhat tribal knowledge. Where inside an organization or a company there's a small group or one person who did it and that small group or individual has moved on and then suddenly someone inherits the aspect of the clean room and the information related to the clean room has been passed on often so many times it's poorly understood by those implementing it an example of that would be the telephone game if you remember as a kid or maybe even as adults you played a game where you have a group of people standing in line and one person whispers into another person's ear and they tell them a very short sentence or a message and then that next person whispers in the next person's ear and so forth and so forth and on and on until at the end of the line um, the final person reveals what he was told and often what's at the end of that telephone game is completely different than the initial sentence at the beginning of that game and that kind of illustrates what often happens in some facilities some cleaner facilities that I've um, had the opportunity to work with have been in existence since even before I started working in cleaners cleaners that have been built since the 1980s or even earlier and obviously the people who started and built those facilities are no longer with the company and unfortunately someone gets handed the project of the cleaner well Bob you're now responsible for the cleaner and the people who are often tasked with those responsibilities um, can't devote the amount of time and resources to even begin to address adequate contamination control of even the normal operations, such as operator training, housekeeping, cleaning garments, 
recertification and cleaner facility maintenance. Um, and often management's attitude towards the entire clean room project, or so to speak, is if it's not broke, don't fix it. And sometimes the, professional, the professionals who are hired to test or maintain the facility's HVAC system may not be trained specifically on clean rooms. And this becomes evident in some of the stories I'm going to tell today where um, you have ceiling located air returns, um, which certainly doesn't work for, for a clean room or contamination control. So the aspect, some of the times these catastrophes are simply that the, um, the individuals who are tasked with handling it don't know any better. And they may not necessarily know where to go to get more information. So I want to tell some general stories today to go over issues where companies have made mistakes in terms of how they've tested their clean room, um, how they've certified the clean room, um, and the type of garmenting and laundering things that they do, as well as housekeeping, to make sure that everyone understands that, hey, there are there um, uh, these type of problems um, do occur. And if they happen to be occurring to you, well, hey, um, that's why we have the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology and organizations like ISO to provide this information in forms of standards, recommended practices, as well as access to subject matter experts for people who can help you say, oh, you know, you have a garmenting problem, we can help you in terms of where do you get the right information on how to select correct garmenting protocols and suppliers. So the number one aspect of preventing any clean room contamination control catastrophe is training. And the training is out there. Um, there are training clean room supports groups, um, management, purchasing, manufacturing, shipping, receiving. These are all part of the group of people within your organization that support your clean room operations. So these people have to be trained um, in a certain degree of contamination control as it affects their jobs or their jobs impact on the overall contamination. For example, management needs to understand what clean rooms are and understanding how the issue funds and budget funds for supplies, cleaning, recertification, testing, and repairs. Purchasing needs to understand that any purchasing changes that they may make um, in terms of suppliers or whatnot or, or equipment needs to fit in within the overall clean room contamination control um, setting. Um, as well as manufacturing, you have to understand this. People in shipping and receiving need to understand that, hey, when stuff that's intended to go into the clean room comes into the facility, they simply can't open it up. The secondary packaging or even shipping packaging needs to be evaluated so that when they open it up, they don't compromise um, components that may be sterile or previously cleaned or packaged in a clean room. Um, and it's very important that everybody has updated standard operating procedures to reflect the current conditions. And one of the problems I see quite a bit um, in terms of auditing and working with facilities and cleanings all over the world, often SOPs aren't necessarily up to date or reflect the actual operating conditions. Or in some cases, sometimes companies don't even have um, standard operating procedures for such things as cleaner housekeeping. So those things are important to stay up to date. And then get the ISO series of clean room standards, extremely important. The ISO series of clean room standards, ISO family standards related to clean rooms, and ISO, of course, is the International Organization of Standardization. And there are a series of 12 different standards related to clean rooms, but the first five relate to all clean rooms. So ISO 14644 part one, well, that's the classification of air cleanliness by particle concentration. And that is the most widely referenced clean room standard because that tells us how clean the air in the clean room should be. Then part two, monitoring provide evidence of clean and performance of air cleanliness by particle concentration is now the required method um, for operating the clean room such that we have a monitoring program. It's not just enough to have a, a clean room, have it tested once a year by a company to come in and do particle counting and get your report, but you need now to have a, a risk-based environmental monitoring program to monitor the aspects of the clean room based upon the risk of the installation, which relates to the types of products being produced. Then part three are clean room test methods. These are all the variety of tests um, some optional, some required that we need to perform in terms of testing a clean room. Then in addition to that, part four, clean room design, construction, and startup. That is the standard that's, that 
provides all of the information related to the clean concept. It provides information not just in terms of how to design a clean room, but how to plan the layout of the clean room for both product movement, personnel movement, such things as uh, change rooms, the flow of change rooms, the flow of material, as well as housekeeping, monitoring, and test design to qualify the clean room are all defined within part four, a very important standard related to overall clean room design um, and construction. Then part five is clean room operations. This particular standard provides information related to uh, flow of material, training, uh, monitoring, as well as different types of gowning, control, and movement of personnel, how personnel should be performed, how they should be trained, and then how they should um, be gowned or the type of gowning or clothing, clean room clothing that they would wear, um, appropriate for the type of clean room as well as the type of operations. Um, and then also get the associated bit recommended practices as they apply to your clean rooms. These are the you know also very important. Um, IEST, the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology, who, who is, uh, this is a, a, our, our podcast here, our broadcast here, um, we have a whole variety of recommended practices like CC, which stands for Contamination Control 003, which are garment system considerations for clean rooms on controlled environments. We have CC18, which is clean room housekeeping, operating and monitoring procedures. How that how you how are you going to clean a clean room? That's really, really important, um, as we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and then other RPs like clean room operations, CC 26, 27, which are personal practices and procedures in clean rooms. Um, part 12, recommended practice 12, considerations in clean room design. And all these documents are really nice. And as much as I'd like to say all these recommended practices and ISO standards are riveting um, documents to read. Um, I find them actually quite interesting because I, this is where I work every day, but it's, it's often difficult to try and absorb all that information. So an additional resource to you is to attend the Institute of Environmental Science and Technologies, STEC, um, which is our, our big conference held every year in the spring, or our fall conferences, or both. Great place to network with um, subject matter experts, people who've been in the industry, um, other people who may have facilities similar to yours to get firsthand information and experience related to clean rooms, contamination control, and help you address all the issues that might affect what it is you're doing. And then also, the last thing is to seek out subject matter experts, input on design operations and testing where applicable. Um, one of the nice things about being at IEST, once you start to network and get to know people and talk, you can send someone an email or give them a phone call um, and sometimes get really valuable information or an, or an opinion on something at, at little or, or, or no cost. You know, people call me all the time and ask me very simple questions. Um, I got a phone call earlier today from someone, um, a former coworker related to particle counts and relative humidity. And um, we had a very good discussion about that and I was able to help him out um, and address some problems that he was seeing. So the whole point of these, these uh, recommended practice and ISO standards really are meant to fit together and help to form um, an envelope of protection related to contamination for our product and our operations. And this particular diagram I have right here kind of illustrates, you know, we start out with the, the end intent is that we want to have our clean room operations. That's a circle in the center of the diagram. Everything we're doing is related to the operation, so we have to back out of that. Well, how did we qualify that room? That room is qualified by a series of tests which all relate back to ISO 14644 clean room design, construction, and startup, how we start the project. When we start the project, we're going to pick out the specifications for our clean room class, and that will be um, helpfully, hopefully determined by ISO 14644 part one, which is our air cleanliness classification standard. But in addition to that, I have a variety of pre-tests, tests that I have to perform on the cleaner before I do the particle concentration tests. And those reflect back into ISO 14644 part three, which is labeled test methods. So what are the proper methods of testing the cleaner prior to doing particle count tests? We have to do pressure differential typically, uh, temperature, relative humidity, air velocities and air changes. And, and then in addition 
to that, we might want to do filter integrity testing or otherwise known as filter leak testing. And from there, we do the, the classification testing. And once a cleaner has been qualified, then we try to move it into the operational phase. And the operational phase talks about such things as housekeeping, as um, clean room garments, how, what our operators wear and behave. And then to wrap it all up, we have the monitoring and periodic testing component, which is ISO 14644 part two, which is the standard used to monitor based upon risk what's going on in the clean room. And if everything's good, the clean room stays in a state of being compliant. And if there's any changes that go on, we have to go through and requalify the room. So this document, I think, is very illustrative of how the standards fit together. Now I'd like to talk about some case studies where companies have had um, made some interesting mistakes and how some of this was revealed. Um, so one thing to start out is that um, <laughs> this my, my, my study of my, my title for this particular case study is smoking cigarettes in a clean room. And way back in 1987, um, when I was new to the industry, um, I was working at a facility where we had some uh, airflow problems. And the first thing about clean rooms, very important to understand that airflow patterns are critical to maintaining the desired contamination control. It doesn't matter if it's an ISO class nine clean room or an ISO class one clean room. Airflow is extremely important. Obviously in ISO class nine, we have a lot higher level of allowable numbers of particles per cubic meter than we would have in an ISO class one. But that said, the amount of air we pump into the room is extremely critical. The direction and volume of air is really important for preventing contamination control. Particle counts, differential pressure, and air velocities are not enough to judge if a cleaner is suitable for the operation. The direction and flow of the air is just as important as all of the parameters, particularly when we're dealing with unidirectional flow cleanrooms. So back in 1987, at an advanced photolithography laboratory cleaner where we're doing projects for the U.S. Navy, a federal standard class one, this was in 1987, so the ISO 14644 series of standards hadn't been created yet, so we were still using the federal standard, um, federal standard 209 clean room classification document. But this clean room was a class one, which was to be equivalent to today's ISO class three clean room. And the wafers we were dealing with, this was a semiconductor facility, um, were being contaminated and some very expensive products were being scrapped. And by very expensive, these were, these were um, uh, very low volume um, computer chips that were being manufactured specifically for the Department of Defense. Um, so these wafers were very expensive and they were being scrapped. And when we were working there, myself and, and my colleagues, um, thought that, hey, maybe airflow, we suspect an airflow of contaminating wafers at a particular inspection station. And we were talking around and, and eventually we came up with the idea like we should do some type of airflow visualization test. And I was extremely young. In 1987, I would have been um, 23 years old and maybe been in the industry for maybe two years um, or so, or in cleaners for about two years or so. Um, so I wasn't really familiar with what an airflow visualization test. So the facilities people at this particular cleaner room, um, and then we were, we were actually in Manassas, Virginia, where the facility was, um, a good old boy from the earlier days of the semiconductor industry um, came up with an idea, well, we're gonna do a smoke study. And uh, the airflow visualization test was conducted using actual cigarettes. So to explain a little bit what's going on, here's kind of a, um, a block diagram of the clean room. And this particular inspection station was a surface particle counter. And everybody who had equipment in this particular facility had to use a surface particle counter to evaluate the cleanliness of their systems. And the surface particle counter was, again, this was 1987, but this was considered at the time the state-of-the-art wafer fab. It had a raised floor clean room, which essentially meant that, again, it was a unidirectional full clean room. So air came out of the HEPA filters and the entire ceiling was covered in HEPA filters and air moved down from the ceiling and then exited through the floors and the floors were perforated um, to allow air to pass through the floors. Now there were certain parts of the floor that weren't perforated like the isolation mask 
which was um, basically constructed so there was no vibrations on the surface particle counter. But most of the floor was simply um, pedestals with these um, um, clean room four tiles, which had holes in them to allow the air to pass through it. So that meant the air was moving truly in a unidirectional method from the ceiling through the floor. And that's the way the room was designed. And that's why the room was considered a, a class one clean room by ISO, uh, by, sorry, by Federal Standard 209. Take on things. So one of the things that happens as a pro as we were there working is they brought in a new machine in this particular section of the clean room, not terribly far away from where the surface particle counter was. Now the people putting in the machinery and were running the fab um, had been doing this for, for years and they knew what they were doing and they had a method to bring in new equipment to make sure they didn't cause contamination problems or so they thought. So what they would do when they brought in a new piece of equipment and had to cut out a wall of the cleaner wall to bring in the new equipment while they're in the process of facilitating it and starting it up and uh, and doing the final setup and assembly of you will of the equipment um, they covered the area with this screen which is low density polyethylene plastic sheeting taped it up and they had clean room tape and they wiped everything down and they they did everything they could to make sure that you know, again, the visqueen wasn't causing a contamination problem. However, we were skidding. We believe we were getting contamination because of the construction. So we came in on a Saturday when production wasn't going on, and the facility manager who I met, um, who I met there on a Saturday, and came in. He handed me a pack of smokes and a lighter, and um, we met in the uh, in the uh, the service bay behind the equipment. We lit up several cigarettes. And we went into the clean room and we proceeded to smoke and watch the smoke flow through the room. Now, this again was a unidirectional flow clean room so that air, the air was expected to move from the ceiling through the floor. But when we started smoking the clean room, the first thing we noticed is that the, the, the smoke was traveling horizontally from over by the construction area into the direction of the surface particle countering where our exposed wafers would normally be. And from that, we were able to identify, you know, through the course of a couple hours and smoking several cigarettes um, and bowling them around the cleaner, we were able to determine the, the airflow patterns. And we identified that air was indeed moving horizontally due to the fact that the construction aspect of the visqueen and the new tool had blocked off a certain portion of the flooring and the air return on one side of the clean room, making suddenly the clean room not a horizontal vertical flow, but somewhat of a, uh, not a horizontal unidirectional flow, but a, a, a vertical, uh, I'm sorry, not a, not a vertical flow clean room, but it became more horizontal. Air was moving from the left to the right, as you see in the diagram here. And it was determined that was probably the source of our contamination. So the, the smoking in the clean room, again, um, helped us identify the problem. And that's also helped um, expose me for the first time the importance of airflow visualization. And um, I actually do a lot of work when I troubleshoot clean rooms um, all over the world. I use airflow visualization as a methodology to determine contamination sources. But we don't use cigarettes anymore. Um, next case study I'd like to talk about is a... Uh, um, again, to stress the importance, it's really important when you build a clean room or operate a clean room to do it um, and to hire um, people who know what they're doing. Um, this was this is a facility out in Northern California. It was an R&D clean room with a class 1000 specification that they'd updated to ISO class six require, and these were requirements set by their customers that they were doing the research and development for. Um, so this particular company had their regular HVAC firm come in and they added HEPA filters to what was was previous office space. They removed the carpet, they put down an electrostatic discharge floor, um, and then they put in the equipment. And the air returns for this class, ISO class six clean room were in the ceiling. And then the clean room testing company that tested the clean room added it out an area in the clean room that had consistently high particle counts. And what they had told simply, they would go on to the person responsible for the clean room 
who incidentally didn't know anything about clean rooms and told him, yeah, it's okay to edit out that particular section of the clean room because it's failing all the time. Oh, because yeah, we've got a sputter over there and we know that's dirty. And that was our excuse that that piece of equipment's dirty. It's always going to be dirty and, and we're just not going to test that. Well, the problem was, you know, the, uh, the customers were complaining about some of the R and D was being contaminated. So they hired um, my company to come in and we did an audit and upon looking at the facility, you know, I told them before doing any type of testing, simply by doing a walk around, looking at the operations and, uh, and not even looking at data. I said, this clean room was never designed to be a class 1000 clean room or ISO class six clean room based upon a variety of different things. Um, one is the ceiling. You have your air returns are in the ceiling. You cannot effectively, um, have a clean room if your air returns are on the ceiling, even if it's ISO class nine. If you're, you know, uh, big particles don't get shed from humans and they get sucked up into the air, up into the ceiling. It doesn't happen. Large particles tend to settle very rapidly. You want your air returns as close to the floor as possible. In addition to that, um, they, they were also underreporting the particle counts. Um, they were incorrecting particles count the particle concentration of particles per cubic meter, but they were actually monitoring particles and particles per cubic foot. So this resulted in particle counts being underreported by a factor of 35 times. Uh, fortunately for this facility, um, we were able to, uh, to help them understand the basics of contamination control and pointed out that, hey, you can't have sheetrock walls inside a, a class ISO class six clean room. You need to have proper either um, uh, clean, room, clean room walls put up or you need to put up an epoxy um, type of paint to allow you to be able to wipe down the walls of the clean room. You have to change your air returns and then you have to address the issue with a particular piece of dirty equipment and uh, we're able to help them out. But again, this ha perfect example because the people who needed the clean room didn't know anything about clean rooms. Their HVAC consultants, the people responsible for the regular building HVAC took on a clean room project saying just moving air if they didn't understand the very fundamentals of clean rooms. And again, they would have avoided these problems if they had consulted ISO 14644 part four, clean room design, construction and startup, or even um, IST recommended practice 12, considerations in clean room design. Very useful and helpful documents. Um, next is a is a case study of a poorly designed and qualified clean rooms, and um, I have a video to go with this. But this was a this was a a, a tissue bank with um, small clean rooms used for tissue extraction. The clean rooms that they had were designed for ISO class five unidirectional full clean rooms. They were designed, built, qualified. In in addition, to that regulators from the FDA had been had inspected the facilities and they'd been in operation for several years. However, the product was being lost due to contamination. They were scrapping product and the environmental monitoring data showed a variety of mold and yeast, but it was somewhat inconsistent. So uh, this particular company contacted um, my company. We went in um, as consultants and when I showed up to look at the, the facility, it was determined we we're gonna do a smoke study. And when I actually walked up and I looked in the window at the facility, um, I realized, oh, you, you're not going to pass the smoke study. You're not going to get unidirectional flow from the room. And uh, yeah, and true to form, we weren't. And part of that has to do with, you can see from the picture here on the left, um, you notice in the ceiling, well, you, you can see my apparatus from doing the smoke study, but you can see where the HEPA filters are and where a series of lights are. And then on the right is a representation of what the room looks like in terms of HEPA filter placement over the, ta the, the table, the sterile field. This is where the cadavers are placed and tissue is extracted. And this of course has to be done um, uh, in, a, uh, in a septic manner because the tissue um, that they're extracting cannot be terminally sterilized. So if you can see where the HEPA filters are and the place of the HEPA filters, um, it's pretty clear that this is not a room designed for unidirectional airflow. And the smoke study, and again, the smoke study had been done prior to this, however, done with the improper equipment, with, a, with uh, the improper understanding of the airflow. But let's look at this. And you can see 
that the propylene glycol, which is the material propylene glycol in water is what we're using to create the smoke, we can see that I actually have turbulence and air recirculating and spinning around above the sterile field, okay? And when you look at that, it's really important to note, you can see the air making a roundabout, it, and, and particularly on the left-hand side of the screen, there is no air movement. And air is actually, if you look at the smoke, it is actually moving from the right-hand side at where the table is towards the left-hand side. Okay, so imagine a person standing here and they're working while well, air is moving over them and in the direction of where the sterile field is. That's a perfect example of non-unidirectional flow. In fact, you have turbulence. And this is something that should never exist in a unidirectional flow cleaner room, particularly, particularly when we're dealing with uh, uh, products that are meant to be aseptically processed. So this particular facility, the problems that they had is it, you know, it had been tested, okay, and tested by um, um, an organization that specialized in testing clean rooms. So the, the clean room pass for particle count tests. However, the particle count testing that they were doing was only in the at rest state, and they were only looking at 0.5 micron particles and not 5 micron particles. And one of the problems earlier we mentioned is they were getting they were getting um, environmental monitoring hits for both mold and yeast, but it was somewhat inconsistent. Well, um, mold and yeast, these are, are um, very large particles when you look in terms of the size of the mold spores um, and so forth. They're quite big. And that's why five micron particles suddenly becomes real important because if I do have mold or stuff, it's going to show up in the one to five or larger micron sizing bin when I look at it with the particle count. But the particle count is passed, but only in the at-rest state. Differential pressure was correct. Air velocities and air volume testing was fine. They did the filter integrity testing. And then they even did an airflow visualization test. And that's the airflow visualization test that they did did not pick up the problem I highlighted in the video because of the nature of the type of airflow visualization they were doing. And here's what was happening. Air was coming out of the HEPA filters. You look back here, you can see um, on, the, on the picture here on the left-hand side, you can see where the HEPA filters are, and then you can see where the lights and blank panels are. So what happened was air was coming out of the HEPA filters at the right velocity, moving down, and then it was being sucked out the side while all returns. Well, the problem was when you have a person in there, the person also redirects the air. And because I have a low pressure area um, over the table where I have my lights and sprinkler, what happens is that creates a turbulent zone. Because it's low pressure, I create an area where air recirculates over my tissue recovery area, an area that they define as being a sterile field. And this was the nature of the contamination problems they were seeing. And this was also amplified because this particular facility had been in operation for several years. How they tested it and the methodology used to test it um, was completely inappropriate because they were using a clean room fogger and not a smoke machine. And one thing to point out is fog. Whenever you see fog in the morning, it's always on the ground. One thing about smoke, smoke tends to rise. It tends to move because this has to do with particle size. So whenever we test the clean room airflow in a clean room, it's very important that um, we have to make sure that the smoke or fog is not too heavy. Otherwise, we can get an um, incorrect conclusion. Um, if it sinks too rapidly, this can bring us to an incorrect conclusion or if it dissipates. So any type of material we use needs to be neutrally buoyant, long lasting, and generated in a correct manner to follow the the airflow streams. And this has to do with the particle size. How big the particles are when we're doing this makes a big difference because this has to, this reflects in terms of the settling um, rate or the settling um, time for particles. This particular graph um, maps out um, the distance, the time it takes in hours for particles to move two meters because we'll lose, use the loose definition that our actual clean zone is about two meters high. You know, that, that extends to about where a person is down past the, the working area. 
And you can see here that um, uh, fog particles tend to start around five microns or so. And you can see a, a five micron particle um, settles two meters in 0.7 hours. Um, a 10 micron particle in 0.2 hours. However, a 0.5 micron particle in still air at 20 degrees takes 56 hours to settle. And so when we do this testing, and I bet we do this testing, what was happening, the clean room certification company was using a fog manifold, and because the fog particles were so heavy, they fell. In fact, they fell just like whether there was airflow or not. And this gave the end user the false impression that they had unidirectional airflow. And I'll demonstrate that here in this particular video. So here's what happens, ultrasonic fog system, it's how they mislead people. So on the left, the cleaner mirror is on. On the right, the cleaner mirror is off. And I'm running my fogger, my ultrasonic fogging system, my clean room fogger, if you will, my very expensive clean room fogger. And you can see that there is absolutely no way to tell if the air is on or off when the fogger is running. You know, if you can see clearly on the picture, the uh, video on the right hand side, the clean room air is off and it, you cannot tell. Okay, that's testing that I did myself. And now I want to, to show you what happens when we, uh, now I'd like to show you what happens when you test it with a propylene glycol based fogging system. The cleaner mirror is off on the left, the cleaner mirror is on on the right. And you can see very clearly the difference. You can tell by looking at the picture on the, the video on the left that the smoke is just it's obviously not moving in the direction of the air returns. The video on the right, the air is forcing the smoke down, and you can see it moving towards the air returns to the right. So this led that particular customer, facility, and clean room testing firm to the incorrect conclusion that we had some type of problem. And this would have, if done correctly with the proper material, um, we would have been able to see this and avoid the problems. So another case study I have is what do you mean you're supposed to clean the clean room? And um, back, again, this was prior to 2000, I was working in Taiwan, um, I was living in Taiwan at the time, in a silicon wafer manufacturing facility, a company that was making um, their brand new aided silicon wafers and selling them to semiconductor manufacturers to turn those into chips. Um, this facility had an ISO class three clean room. Um, and again, this was right as, this was right around the turn of the century. So ISO 14644 had just been published and had been in draft. And these people were pretty, um, this particular company was pretty um, intent on trying to follow this. Um, but they had customer complaints about particles and silicon wafers. And interesting enough, the clean room, and again, they had raised four clean rooms and I have a picture of a race for cleaning what it looks like on the left hand side with the tiles pulled up so you can see that air is meant to pass through through the uh, the floor and that actually creates a plenum for a return air um, so the, the cleaner is being monitored for 24 hours a day seven days a week for particles 0.1 micron greater for all the work areas each wafer was scanned with the surface particle counter prior to packaging and Every wafer had less than 10 particles, 0.3 micron or greater. However, um, the wafers were packaged, tested good to the factory. When the customer tested the wafers, they were getting particles on the wafers. So the question was initially, were the particles coming from the shipping material? Were they coming from transit? Were they coming from how the customer opened the wafers at, you know, when they received them and inspected them? Or were they coming in the packaging? And we were looking at all those things. But on an additional audit, we started to look at what was going on, and we noticed that they had open cassettes for testing and packaging of the clean wafers while they're being packed into clean package shippers. All materials were tested clean, and the test equipment was correctly calibrated. And the continuous particle monitoring showed that there were no deviation in particle levels. But the audit on close examination, when we got there with bright lights, we found visible contamination on most of the horizontal surfaces. 
And as we probed into the clean room, housekeeping aspects of the clean room, a recent change in management had revealed that current management, the, the people who replaced the people who had built the facility, took exception with the increased airborne particle counts that happened when they in, whenever they did housekeeping operations. Keep in mind they had a continuous particle monitoring system spread throughout the clean room. Multiple locations were monitoring particles down to 0.1 micron. And the current management, whenever they saw there was a housekeeping procedure, whenever the operators were going through and wiping down surfaces, they saw huge spikes in airborne particle counts. Well, that freaked them out, right? Uh, and so they suddenly started like, you know, one of the things that they asked is like, how do we do housekeeping without increasing our particle counts in the clean room? And, and the response, you know, when they asked that question, I, I, I laughed at them and said, you can't. <laughs> housekeeping is in its very nature is going to stir up particles. You know, we want to make sure we're wiping down surfaces with the with the proper um, wipers, the proper wiping solution, the proper mops. But you certainly can expect an increase in airborne particle counts whenever you have a housekeeping operation, because that's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, but during housekeeping, that's when you put your product away. You you close up everything. And they had some. They didn't understand that particular process. In addition to that, we found a high degree of elect. So they weren't doing housekeeping and hadn't been doing housekeeping for several months. Um, so that's why we started to see, you know, visible particles starting to show up on some horizontal surfaces. In addition to that, in the packaging area, they had a high degree of electric static charge due to the plastic associated with the wafer shippers. Um, and the point being is even class one or really clean clean rooms need to be clean and clean properly. In addition to that, um, ionization, um, can help uh, reduce electrostatic charge. Reduction of electrostatic charge not only reduces electrostatic discharge, um, though they didn't have an issue with discharge, but they did have an, an issue with electrostatic attraction. And charge objects, objects that are, have a high degree of electrostatic charge, attract particles. And just a case in point, if anybody remembers the uh, the older television sets and older computer monitors that had the cathode ray tube, you know, the big tube type monitors and TV sets. If you ever looked at the surface of one of those, you'd see that they're always covered in dust. Well, it's because the, uh, the, uh, the uh, nature of the beast, we have a, 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 a <laughs> We have a, a high charge directed because of the cathode ray tube induces a charge on the glass, the outside charge or the front surface of the glass of the of the of the TV or or or, or computer monitor, the old style, um, has a charge and that pulls particles out of the air and they stick to that glass surface. So if these this customer, particular customer had followed ISO 14644 Part 5, clean room operations, or IST recommended practice 18, clean room housekeeping operation and monitoring procedures, they would have realized the, uh, the aspect of the proper cleaning and would have avoided these problems. Another, uh, another story I have here is an example. Um, this again happened in Southeast Asia. This is actually was Malaysia. Um, a component manufacturer in factory was company making um, metal components for the hard drive industry. They were serving the larger um, final hard drive companies, I think uh, either Fujitsu or Hitachi um, or Seagate at the particular time. And uh, so we conduct, I was asked to do a supplier audit of this component manufacturer. It was a metal fabrication facility. They were making metal components and cleaning the components prior to shipping them to the hard drive factory where they would be assembled as part of a final hard disk drive. Um, but the end user complaints were they were having inconsistent part cleanliness. So in the audit, we found that the cleaner was built out of used salvage panels and used HEPA filters. They had never done any type of filter integrity testing on the filters and panels. Some of them had residual oil in them in the installed cleaner. Um, a, couple of the, a couple of the HEPA filters actually had handprints in them. Um, and um, then the housekeeping, the cleaner housekeeping was conducted by the same staff and the same equipment. Um, that they used to clean the toilets. So the mops that were used to clean the bathrooms were the same mops, the same buckets, 
were being used to mop the clean room. Um, and uh, they had no clean room laundry. The staff were instructed to take their clean room suits home on Fridays and to wash them. And we were in Southeast Asia, particularly Malaysia at the time. Um, the clean room, the clean room garments were so damp, and some of them you could actually see through. So the, the garments were no longer providing the filtration or the barrier aspect. Um, and when we asked the management about it, they said, well, they were quite, they said, hey, look, we, we have our operators washing their bunny suits. That's what they call bunny suits once a week. So again, you know, ISO 14644-5 operations, as well as um, IST recommended practice three, garment system considerations for clean rooms um, would have helped to avoid some of those problems. Um, continuing through, not the same facility, but a, there was a, a clean room laundry, a privately held clean room laundry that we also audited um, during my time there. And they had a, a cost crazy purchasing manager that changed the, uh, the use of non-ionic surfactant to using laundry detergent. Um, now the laundry detergent they switched to, it was an organic uh, uh, laundry detergent, but this resulted in customer garments being damaged. And this created such a backspin um, and resulting cover up um, that it resulted in lost customers and the purchasing manager eventually being fired. So here's an example where purchasing can directly affect what's going on inside the clean room and can affect the company's bottom line. And um, another case study, and it's really important to understand how these all fit together. Um, in Southern California, there was a trading company that had devised a plan to manufacture eye drops. Um, eye drops for both the US market and overseas. And they wanted to take the advantage of made in America with products sold, um, sold in the US and actually in the Middle East. Um, so they had an uncontrolled warehouse that they already owned and they stuck a clean room in the middle of it. And they bought a catalog class 100 clean room. And this is a technical clean room. And, and, and when I say technical clean room, I mean it's a clean room that's simply designed to be a clean room. It may not necessarily have all the, uh, the features that we would expect for a life science clean room with smooth surfaces that are easy to wipe down with no gaps no cracks, no places where contaminants um, can hang out or areas that are very difficult to clean. Um, noticeable on this particular picture, you'll notice that all of the windows, um, all of the corners are sharp corners, no rounded corners. And the one thing about corners, these typically are areas that prov provide, us, provide a place for dirt and contaminants to hang out, areas that you can't clean very well, and you can definitely not sterilize. And if it's a class 100 medical facility, and because it was eye drops, it means it has to be in a septic operation. Um, so um, they contacted, they originally contacted myself to ask them what type of particle counter they should use for, for an aseptic operation. Um, I happened to be in the area at the time and I looked at the facility, it brought me the facility into the warehouse, the uncontrolled, untemperature controlled warehouse. And we looked at the cleaner and it was very clear that the, it was completely inadequate. They had no idea regarding the manufacture of sterile products. And eventually the FDA and US government permanently shut this uh, company down or that operation down. And if they had referenced um, the, the very fundamental document related to uh, um, USGMP, which is the 21st Code of Federal Regulations, Section 211, sterile drug products produced by septic manufacturing, um, Section C, or for formulation for 503, 503B facilities. All this information um, was there for them. And um, this is uh, uh, the last story I have today. Um, case study for an accepting filling line in India. This happened, um, I, I was there last year. I was there to conduct a smoke study and audit of the septic operations. Now I'm, a, I am, I'm an American, I'm 53 years old, and I'm around 270 pounds. Um, so fitting in standard Indian clean room apparel can be quite difficult. In Asia, it, it is extremely hard. It's now such that whenever I travel, I bring my own pre-sterilized um, and packaged uh, clean room laundry suits anyhow. But this particular customer had autoclave shoes that were made out of solid latex. And they were undersized for myself, um, but they were very difficult to work and kind of cumbersome. 
And the autoclave shoes have been autoclaved so many times, they became the hardest and most uncomfortable shoes you could imagine. Um, so after three days of working in these shoes for in excess of eight hours per day, gowned up, um, I finally asked the company staff, the guys I was working with, the five people inside the, the septic suite I was working with, do these shoes hurt your feet? Of which every single person nodded in agreement. Oh yeah, these shoes hurt our feet. Um, <laughs> and they've been wearing the shoes for years. So uh, I took the shoes out to the managing director who had phoned me in from the United States, India to, to work at the facility. And I sat him on his desk and I said, these shoes are terrible. I understand I'm not here to evaluate your garmenting, but these shoes hurt your worker's feet. And if you're hurting someone by the working in the cleaner, you're going to generate more contamination. In addition to that, if you have employee safety gear or, or cleaner suits that are painful, it, it you know, you're not, not an employer that's going to um, inspire a lot of loyalty. Though cultures are different, unfortunately, but these shoes were really uncomfortable and all the people I talked to wore the shoes, admitted that they did hurt their feet and management did commit to change. So I'm going back in a couple months, um, I'll be able to see if they've actually done that. And the last thing is to make sure, this is the picture of myself on the far left-hand side of the document where back in 2007, I was asked to evaluate the environmental monitoring of a Thai pharmaceutical facility. And they had absolutely no garments that could even stretch around me. So I spent the entire day running around the facility in a frock that I could barely button in front of me and my underwear and booties running around inside a sterile manufacturing facility. Then this was, of course, they were going to do triple cleans after I was there. But um, always important to be prepared and to have the proper size garments for whoever may come to your facility. And that is my last um, last slide. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Um, I hope you find this interesting. I hope this helps you all understand where to get uh, um, more information related to your facilities. And um, just to make sure you stayed, everyone's stayed awake, I have a short little quest test for you. What parameter indicates a cleaner performance? The answer to that would be, was it particle counts, pressure differential, airflow rate, airflow direction, or all of the above? Let's say all of the above. How do you avoid a cleanroom catastrophe? Wash your, your cleanroom suits correctly, training, use good HEPA filters or keep the pest outs. Training's most important. And then what ISO standards apply to all cleanrooms? Is it just ISO 14644 part one? Or does part two, part three, part four, or part five all help? Well, all of these apply to all clean rooms, regardless of the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. And hopefully you have a nice day.